Hello and welcome to Media 7. In this week's show, we run the rule over public relations. What is it? What are its rules? And do we even know when we're soaking in it? Also, we talk to National Business Review publisher Barry Coleman about his decision to charge to read stories on his paper's website. A landmark response in the crisis in newspapers or just something that's been tried before and failed? But first, PR. And to get us started, Simon Pound ponders why it might be known as the dark arts. The Tony Veach assault case media circus brought the back room role of media minder to the front. Glenda Hughes was Veach's PR, pushing his side of the story. But how far did she go? Journalist Jock Anderson asked if the role Hughes played in the story was appropriate. He complained to Prins, the Public Relations Institute. They found that Hughes did not breach their code of ethics. The code includes these provisions. Avoid deceptive practices. Counsel colleagues on ethical decision making. Decline representation of clients or organisations that urge or require actions contrary to this code. Which makes it all sound rather like a secret fraternity. Maybe that's why PR is known as the dark arts. Further to rejecting the complaint, Prin stated, the media need to accept that the hiring of people to provide professional advice regarding media or communication matters is no different to hiring a lawyer, accountant or engineer. The idea that it takes professionals to navigate the media minefield has some merit when you see the pressure the spotlight can bring. But does involving PR lessen or intensify the glare? And what is the appropriate role of PR professionals in public interest stories. Joining me to talk about what's right and what's not are AA spokesman and PRIN's Northern Division Chairman, Simon Lamborn, yep. Karen Beanland, who was Geoffrey Palmer's Beehive Press Secretary and later fronted for Fletcher Challenge and Ports of Auckland, AUT Senior Communications Lecturer, Helen Sissons, uh, author of the text Practical Journalism, How to Write News, and director of Kiwi Public Relations, which helps charitable groups sell themselves. And the man you saw before, Truth's chief reporter, Jock Anderson, whose complaint against Glenda Hughes reminded us all that the Code of Ethics existed. I should note that we did approach Glenda Hughes, who did not return our calls. But welcome to you all, and thank you, you for turning up. Uh, Simon, I I'll ask Jock about this in a moment, but what did... Prins actually do with his complaint about a possible breach by Glenda Hughes in the Veach case? Well, the first thing they did was they set up an independent investigating, investigating committee of very senior practitioners. It was the national president of Prins, uh, there was a fellow of the institute and a life member. Now, that's a very senior grouping. They investigated the complaint, uh, they spoke with Glenda, and they ruled that there was no breach. <coughs> now, I had no involvement in that, and it's not appropriate that I say anything else other than they ruled in Glenda's favour and against Jock. Can I ask you to venture on that? I've seen the response that, uh, that Jock got back from your national president, um, Graham Purchase, mm -hmm. which said there was no breach of the code. It didn't say that Glenda Hughes had no role in altering the letters that went to the court in support of Tony Veach. Can we assume that if they said there was no breach of the code of ethics, then she didn't do that? Because it doesn't say that in the letter. Well, I haven't seen the letter. I've seen the press statement that they issued uh, to the media and to the industry, uh, and that says that there was no breach. I've got no reason to suspect otherwise, so I, I have to accept them on their word. But, but again, can we assume that if there was no breach that she didn't alter the letters herself? I think so, yeah. Hmm. How many times, how often does it happen that uh, someone does fall foul or there are complaints against your code of ethics? Well, there haven't been that many complaints over the years. And I think, as you said earlier, you know, you've only just realised that there is a code of ethics Which for, I think for is the possibly Institute. a good thing. Yeah, and we were talking earlier on today about whether actually there was a code for journalists as well. Um, so sometimes these things aren't known. But certainly within the industry itself, the new practitioners uh, coming out of the tertiary institutions and people joining up to the uh, Institute, uh, we're all aware that there is a code of ethics that you have to abide by, and uh, heaven help you if you don't. Uh, it was interesting, the letter also, also referred to, it's the same as hiring a lawyer or engineer. Is Prins really at that stage yet where it, it, it can claim some sort of parity with those professional bodies? Is that, is that what you're heading for? Well, I think we can put our hands on our hearts and say, look, we are a profession. Communications is a specialist skill. Um, some people specialise in media communications, other ones specialise in government communications. Um, it, 
takes training, either sort of you know at the coalface in the workplace or through an institute. Um, so we can actually lay some claim to being a profession. And we saw the cameras surrounding Tony when he came out of the court. That's a lot of pressure for someone to handle. People seek legal advice, and this is no different. Tony sought advice through Glenda to help him with his communications. I'll, I'll go to Jock now, because you started the whole thing rolling. Do you accept that people in, in those positions where they're under the media spotlight are doing the right thing and are pretty much obliged to hire PR advice? I don't think so, and I actually think that the so far the response from Prince is absolute rubbish. Um, they have done nothing at all, in my mind, and I'm sure in the public's mind, uh, to enhance um, the, uh, their profession whatsoever, they call it a profession. Um, what we have to constantly remember in the Veach affair is that both sides engage PR people to manipulate the media at the very highest levels to ensure that the particular parts of their case or their argument or their, their, uh, uh, their beliefs and views uh, were put into the media. And um, I, for one, find that uh, quite abhorrent, quite frankly. And I also find that the, that the stance that Prince took uh, when I complained about what I believe to be a fundamental issue of misleading the court, and I think that is at the hub of this, at the nub of this whole thing, is that someone misled a New Zealand court. No one... But even you don't know that it was Glenda Hughes? No, I don't. Um, I have a pretty good idea how it was done. And if I could prove it, I would publish it. I'm still working on that, and I'm sure that I will be able to prove it, um, because the matter is not over yet. The Law Society are still investigating uh, certain roles. Uh, but the response I got, um, and in fact the media release that went out, is exactly the same as the letter that I got. Uh, it tells us basically nothing. Uh, I sought to find out from Prince what questions were asked of Glenda Hughes and what replies she gave. I was told the matter was closed. End of it. Finish. Go away. Simon, can you respond to that at all? No, I can't, because I no, wasn't involved fair in enough. the process. You, you, you weren't involved. No. Is this the end of the road for you in Prince? Absolutely not. What's no, next? There is a story here, and um, I will do my damnedest to uh, unearth it, despite Prince and whatever um, efforts they might put in my way, because I think this is an important public issue. This is just not... PR. This is deliberately misleading a court of law in New Zealand, and I don't think that's on. Which is separate from the principle of hiring communications advice when you're in a position like that, because I, I would submit to you, John, well, that, it... <laughs> that anyone who represented themselves to the media in a, in a position like that would have a fool for a PR person. Well, it may well be, but I think you have to look at what public relations is all about. If public relations is an honest craft and an honest practice, why have they chosen to hide this particular case? I can't think of a more important case, a fundamentally more important case, than this particular one. It's not because I've got a bee in my bonnet about it. A lot of people have spoken to me about this. A lot of public relations people have spoken to me about it. Some said, you know, keep on at Prince, Keep on at the Law Society. Keep on at whoever you have to keep on at to find out the truth about this. There is a truth there. And, uh, and we will keep on doing it. Um, if the public relations people choose to say, well, look, there's nothing there, we've investigated it, but we're not going to tell you what we did, we're not going to tell you what we asked, we're not going to tell you what was said, and or, by the way, uh, inquiries are not independent, they're conducted by other members of the same union uh, or the, the institute, um, they're not held in public. Uh, you know, how can the public have confidence in the credibility of such inquiries. Well, we'll look forward to the mm. next chapter of that one. I'm sure it's not over. Uh, Karen, you worked in both political and corporate public relations. Yes. Were there ever times when you felt it wasn't an honest profession, where you felt eth ethically challenged? Uh, no, I, ne I have never felt uh, ethically compromised in anything that I've ever done. And I think that um, what needs to be understood, that good public relations involves the person, the practitioner, uh, establishing a relationship with the, the organisation that they're representing or working for, where there is a situation of trust and um, of, of full understanding and exchange of ideas. And a good PR person, if there's a problem in the organisation, is telling the management that there's a problem in the organisation and they've got to address the problem. And but, if management doesn't, does that mean the PR person's hung out to dry? And takes the flag. Potentially, it can it can mean that, but 
you, you know, at the end of the day, you probably have to have a stand-up argument. And I, I've fought some battles along those lines at my, in my time. But I've never been a, put in a position where I've felt ethically compromised by what, what I've had to do. The, the fine line comes when you're, when you're asked not to say something. You know, when, when you've got a situation where there is perhaps a very valid reason to say nothing. And, you know, that can be in a situation where there's going to be a legal inquiry, for instance, where there's going to be a health and safety inquiry. Uh, and I've been in those situations. And you just have to be upfront and say, look, terribly sorry, I'd love to tell you the full story here, but, you know, it's going to an inquiry and we can't make any more comment at this stage. Now, journalists don't like that. No, they'll they, probably think you're they lying. They don't like you for saying that. But, you know, that's the professional position that you have to take. Mm. Um, Helen, you've looked at the relationship between people in PR and journalists o over some time. How has that relationship evolved? I think traditionally uh, there was a very arm's length relationship between public relations practitioners and journalists. Um, there weren't that many PR professionals around. Um, if you were a journalist and you wanted to ring uh, the police, you would actually ring the sergeant in charge of the case. Now you have to go through, you know, a PR person to get to that person. And the argument is, of course, that they will facilitate that, that they will find you the right person. But I think most journalists would say if they're any good at their job, they would know the right person to go to anyway. Um, over the last te in the last decade, I'd say there's been a, a cozying up of journalists and PRs. Is that, is that a good thing? Um, it depends on your point of view. Um, as a journalist, I would say that there is a real danger to what we what to the to the information that we now get in our, our media. Um, Paul Dryden has um, said that about 60% of the stories that now appear in the New Zealand media are. A source from PR in Britain, uh, research out of Cardiff, has said that it's, it's about 80%. Um, I would say that that's actually very concerning. I would say it's time that we looked very carefully. Um, but the relationship now is very close, and it isn't all the PR's fault. Um, the media um, uh, organisations have to take a lot of responsibility uh, because they have um, slashed the numbers of reporters available to investigate in the newsrooms. I was talking last That's night. That's the driver, isn't it? <coughs> Exactly. You have to recycle the press release because there's no one to go out there. But also, and... it's about the um, training as well. Um, in the past, you were trained by senior reporters. Uh, now you are trained by universities. Um, and that, I think, means there is like an interruption almost in the community of practice and the passing on of the skills. Mm. Simon, what's your relationship with journalists? What, what do you do for well, each other? Is some, it, is it some, some of them are great friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to admit that publicly. <laughs> um, but equally, I have to say, you know, some of the toughest interviews I've had have been actually from journalists that I've known in a personal capacity as well. I mean, I do take issue with Jock, what Jock said before uh, about public relations people being obstructive. Uh, the one phone conversation I've had with him, he actually used me as the touch point for our organisation um, rather than going to the person directly. So there I was acting in a facilitating and helpful role. Um, is, is that good PR? Because I'm, you know, in you know, journalism jobs, I've always been grateful when someone can do that, can direct me to the person who has what I need. I've been doing it for approximately 14 years. I can only really recall one occasion where an editor has absolutely abused me at the end of a phone. Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of all the media contact I have is very friendly, appreciated, um, and sure, we may not always agree or uh, we may disagree on issues, um, but I always try and help them with their inquiry, point them to the appropriate person, and ensure that that person is as well briefed as they can be. Do you um, ever get on the phone and shout down the line at a journalist who you think has stitched you up? <laughs> or is that just not something you do? I, I, I just don't believe it's appropriate to, to get on the phone and yell at someone. Um, I think I, I never was a journalist. Some PR people were. Um, I never trained as a journalist, but I have an understanding of what they're after. Um, so when they approach us with a story or an inquiry, you know, I try and help them create that story as much as possible. Um, if we're looking at a piece of information and, and I know what well, the journalist is going to ask this question next, then don't wait for the journalist to ask that question. You know, provide them with that information up front. Mm, and we'll, we'll talk about why journalists go into PR in the, in the next segment. But Jock, can you I, rang Simon. Up on this? Yeah. I mean, you rang, I'm, clearly I'm, you talk I'm sitting to these here people sometimes. and I don't actually believe what I'm hearing. Um, if, if, if any PR person barked down the phone at me, it would go in the paper, word for word, verbatim. Uh, with plonker on top of it. No, picking, up, picking up on Helen's point about the police. I could quote you, and I have got mountains of information to show you, that as far as public relations and, and media communications are concerned, the New Zealand police would have to be one of the worst organ publicly funded organisations that I have ever had to deal with. 
Brief example, a few months ago, uh, our paper, Truth, decided to do a campaign on knife crime. We contacted the so-called communications managers from the Auckland uh, Police District, the County's Manukau Police District. As everyone knows, County's Manukau is the busiest crime district in the whole of New Zealand. It's just had a shocking report on its disorganisation released today. Um, we got no response whatsoever. We wanted to speak to the district commanders. We wanted to speak to frontline cops who had been confronted by knife wielders. We waited and waited and waited, day I, I after am, day I after day. I am going to have to stop and this, this, Im <laughs> this impassioned speech, Jock. I, I get the feeling that, that you hanker for the old days when you just go and talk to your mate down we the did, station. We carried on with our campaign and despite them. Right. Well, we will take a break now, and when we return, get down to the nuts and bolts. How does PR work? What flavours does it come in? And does it do what it says on the label?